for the last lesson of this course, I, I decided to, to give you an overview on uh, Riemann surfaces. I, I decided to, to, to choose this as, a, as the last topic because I, I believe it is a very nice uh, um, topic where you can see the tools we have studied uh, applied in several ways. Okay, and in some sense, it's a good a good uh, field uh, uh, for those who are interested also in other in other subjects. Mm. So, first of all, well, Riemann is a name, is a family name. But what about surfaces? Are you familiar with surfaces? So do you know anything from real geometry which reminds you the word surfaces? Well, it's natural to, to have at least a naive idea of what a surface is, right? Well, a surface is, well, <laughs> something, some deformation of a plane in the space. This is what, say, if you ask anybody from the street, it's like, well, surface is, well, something wrapping, <laughs> right? To be more precise, well, let me tell you what is a Riemann surface, and I start with this very, very strict, but in some sense also very uh, condensed definition, and then I will go into the detail. So, one-dimensional kinetic complex manifold. So, uh, I want to just give uh, some ideas of what a manifold is. A manifold is a generation of, on, on, uh, of, uh, of a surface. So if you don't know what a surface is, it's difficult to say, well, manifold is a generation of a, of a manifold, of a, of a surface. But in any case, what we can do is that if we, we, if we give a definition quite general, you can see that it can be generalized as much as you want, and you will obtain the general definition of a manifold. So, one dimensional will be explained very soon. Complex will be explained very soon. Manifold will be explained soon. But at least connected is something you can understand now. It's a connected set, but it is not necessarily assuming a general definition since you can talk of several connected components of a Riemann surface. Okay, so in any case, connected. Here means exactly what you expect to have. It is uh, uh, a set which cannot be split into two parts, right? Or more than two parts. Good. So let us go to the basic definition. A one-dimensional uh, uh, complex manifold is and connected. Well, we are assuming that it is connected, so connected. Uh, Hausdorff topological space. Hausdorff means, you know, you should know this, right? T2 topological space. So you can separate points with neighbors, neighborhoods, right? And then we have also a complex atlas, a maximum complex atlas uh, on this topological space. That is a family of local coordinates. There's pairs of sets and functions like this. And the description is like is here. So u j for each j is an open set in X. X is a topological space, so this means something, right? Furthermore, if you consider the union of all u j's, then you obtain X. So it is what what is called a covering but not in the sense of covering space, right? A covering of X. They can be overlapping parts, but n n no. So it is an, an open cover of X. HFJ maps UJ into C. This is the only reason why we call complex here, OK? If you put R something, it is real, right? Okay, C and then C1, I omitted one, but gives you the dimension okay, of the manifold. If it, in any case, HUJ is homomorphically mapped 
onto the open set Vuj and C. Vj, you, uh, v, sorry, I forgot to put a J, right? Vj, Uj, I'm sorry for this. So this means that we have a topological space and locally, since any point is at, in at least one of these Uj's, which cover everything, and locally, you have a function which maps neighborhood of this point into an open set of C in this case. And these are called local coordinates because the idea is that while the surface is like Earth, and locally you have the coordinate, geographical coordinates or charts, right? And you transform something which is not flat into something which is flat because C is like R2. When you have something which locally is like an open set homeomorphic to an open set of R2, then you are talking about a surface and C is like R2, right? So in general here you can have a very, a more generic, well you can, have, you can even have a Banach space, but you say in general you have Rn or Cn. In the first case you are talking about real manifold and the exponent represents the real dimension. And the case you have CK, K is the complex dimension of the complex manifold. So one dimensional complex manifold, in this case, is what we are studying, is also, can be also regarded as a two-dimensional real manifold because the underlying structure of R2 is here, right? Okay? So when I say dimension, I have always, always to be more precise and to indicate with respect to what, to C or to R. Up to now, we are not using any regularity. I want to, to, to remark this now. Phi j is just in the class of function which give information about the topology. It's so homomorphism, right? We are not assuming that phi j is something else, but we cannot because uj is just an open set in a topological space. We cannot say, well, I want phi j to be, I don't know, complex analytic, harmonic. I can't because I cannot define, well, up to now I cannot define holomorphicity, analyticity, harmonicity in a topological space. We just have a topological structure on X. However, we transfer charts locally this vague topological space onto something we know. So the, the ground is in our case C, right? In general it can be Cn or Rk or what I said before. Then the last property we require is what makes you understand why we are transferring information from one set topological to the other because whenever we have an intersection of two neighbors, neighborhoods of, of the family UJs. So you assume that UJ and UK intersect. Of course they intersect in an open set, right? And these two um, open set uh, are the set of definition of phi j and phi k respectively, right? Because for each uj you have also phi j which is a homomorphism. Then you can consider this function here, fkj which is fj minus 1 and then fk. But fj minus 1, this remember, um, is, uh, is an open set in C. So this function here is a function from C into C. It's an open set of C, the domain of this function. And the value is an open set, the value there. The range is an open set in C, from C into C. Okay, do you see this? So phi j maps homomorphically x, so a small neighborhood of a point in x, onto an open set in C. 
and then I have VK similarly mapping an, op an open set UK into an open set. So then I consider this diagram. So starting from here, from the ground, I go to X and then map into the open set VK UJ into set UK. This is a function from C into C, from open subset of C, from an open subset of C, this, into an open subset of C. And then I can use my notion of holomorphicity. This is what I require in this case, but in general what I have for, for granted is that this function here is, cannot be, it's an homomorphism, right? Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. The, the, uh, the remark is not correct, I have to say. Phi j is just an homeomorphism, so it is invertible, and the inverse function is still continuous, right? So, what I can definitely say, if I don't assume anything about, even if I don't know anything about this set, but of course I have to put some topology on this set, well, this composition of two functions, which are homeomorphic, of homeomorphism, is necessarily an homomorphism, right? So these two sets here are homomorphic. What I cannot say is that this is an invertible holomorphic function. I have to require this function is holomorphic. I cannot even have for granted this is holomorphic if this is C. I can say, well, this is a complex value function, but not necessarily holomorphic. In general, this function here tells you the regularity of the manifold you are requesting. So if you don't require anything here, you have what we say topological manifold. Okay? And in fact, these are the important functions you, you have to consider and they are called change of local coordinate. That's obvious. Okay? You move from one chart into the other or transition function. And in general, oops, sorry. In general, this function here, according to the fact that phi j is homomorphism into something else than C, like Cn or K or whatever, can have different regularity. For instance, if this uh, C be replaced by, say, R2 or I, Rn in general, and fkj is supposed to be different, complex, so a real differentiable, you are talking about a differentiable real manifold. Assume that the transition function is real analytic, you are talking about real analytic manifold. So the information of regularity is not on the local coordinates, cannot be regular, but on the transition, right? This is general, okay. So now, the reason why this one-dimensional complex manifold are called surfaces is because, well, a surface is a, a two-real-dimensional two manifold, and one complex dimensional means two-real-dimensional, right? That's the reason why surface when, um, was, a, was, um, was used but in general, you can talk about manifolds, okay, manifolds. So now, with the definition of local coordinate, we can give also the notion, the definition of, of uh, holomorphic function between two Riemann surfaces, but in general, more, more in general, between two complex manifolds. And the reason is the following. You start from a function f between two say one dimensional complex manifolds. This is the function f between x and y. And it is to be holomorphic at a point. Remember that we define holomorphicity locally, right? At a point, and then we had a neighborhood where you would, okay. So locally at a point, we can use the change of coordinates and transfer everything into C, right? And use the coordinates of P and on F of P. F of P is also a point 
you know, Riemann surfaces. So locally, it can be so red on the ground floor. So you put a composition like this, and you consider a function from C into C. So you have a function from two topological spaces, which locally are homeomorphic to C, and this local coordinate system allow you to define uh, holomorphicity, for instance. In general, you can define, well, harmonicity, uh, real analyticity, and so on and so forth, according to the properties of the change of coordinates. So I summarize this idea here in this remark. If you just assume that uh, transition functions are real differentiable, then the, 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 the manifolds are real differentiable, or CK, or Lipschitz, or Laplacian, uh, sorry, or analytic, and so on and so forth. And then also, function between this class of manifolds can be defined to be whatever you want, okay, whatever you want, whatever you can say, all right? So in general, you, you have a topological space, locally homomorphic to something else, to some model space, this is the idea, and well, well, what you can always do is to use topological characteristics. You can say the F is continuous. Well, this doesn't require the structure of the manifold. But if you want something else like analytic regularity, you have to work on the model instead of working in these topological spaces. This is the main idea, all right? And this applies not, for, not only for one complex manifold, but for real, uh, more than one dimensional uh, complex manifold and so on. So this is a general idea in geometry, okay? You can, we can have, well, we have models. Yeah, of course we have. We have this, the standard surfaces in R3 are models like this, okay? If the surface is not odd in the sense that there are some uh, singular points or singular curves, so if it is smooth enough, so you can locally transform everything into uh, an open set of R2, with functions which are sufficiently, <coughs> sufficient to, mm, not only, well, sufficiently regular in the sense that they can be also not only continuous with inverse continuous, but also, well, maybe more. And then you can define frames, you can work on the tangent, you can define, right, uh, uh, indicators of the orthogonal directions and so on and so forth. So you can talk about orientation so, and all this stuff, which is quite natural to do. But in general, well, this, this is called uh, embedded, okay, embedded manifold, because you have uh, the universe which tells you what to do in some sense. If you want to measure a vector in the tangent space, you can obviously apply the standard Euclidean metric, Euclidean scalar product you have from, from R3, which is natural to consider. So it is just a vector, tangent vector, okay? Imagine to have a curve in a surface. You can always consider the tangent vector to be the velocity, okay? It is not a point of the surface, but it is on the tangent plane which moves smoothly on the surface if the surface is sufficiently good without odd points. It's not like a cone or like a roof like this. But if it is smooth, you can go around okay, and live in this tangent, tangent, place, tangent plane moving around. Then you can measure distances using Scalar product, but the scalar product is given from the structure, the Euclidean structure of R3. So the fact that the, what we have in mind is that R2, so the, the surface is embedded in R3, gives us many other information. But in general, you have a not embedded 
um, manifold and you have to define a way to measure tangent vectors and so on and so forth. And since you have the choice of changing the way of measuring this, you can find different ways of uh, defining a, a scalar product on, on each tangent space. Okay. Well, but this is beyond the, the, probably you will have a course in uh, differential geometry in the second term. So in case, keep this in mind when you will see it, okay? I will not go into the, uh, the this, the, this uh, aspects of uh, Riemannian geometry. So this is the first very important result, which is not obvious to prove. We have proved one part of this. Essentially that we know any simply connected domain, plane domain different from C is biomorphic to the unit disk. This was already something, but there is a more general and more, uh, I'd say, and a deeper result which tells us that, well, simply connected Riemann surfaces uh, are essentially up to biomorphism only three. The disk, the plane, and the Riemann sphere. Right? So in the plane case, we already said, okay, the plane and all the other simply connected domain are into two classes, but this is something else. Okay. To start from a Riemann surface that is a one complex manifold, you assume that it is simply connected, then it is necessarily biomorphic to one of the three models. And this is the starting, very important result, starting point uh, of, our, of our consideration. Now, if you have a Riemann surface, then you can always cover it with a simply connected Riemann surface X tilde. So now we use something which comes from covering, topological covering, and this can be, this proposition can be rephrased in this way. So to start from a Riemann surface, not necessarily simply, well, if it is simply connected, uniformization theorem tells you that it is biomorphic to one of the three. But if it is not, then it can be always covered by another Riemann surface, which is simply connected. In other words, you can say that we can take as a covering a universal covering. Remember that universal was the uh, precise terminology we use to introduce for coverings with a covering space which is simply connected. And this covering space, is, which in principle is just one a topological space, it turns out to be a Riemann surface. So it has a structure of complex manifold, one dimensional complex manifold. So you can cover a, a Riemann surface with uh, another Riemann surface which is simply connected. This is very important. So it means up to allomorphism, you cover every, every Riemann surface by the disk, the plane, or this, the Riemann sphere. Furthermore, the covering, the covering function P turns out to be even more the continuous as objective. It turns out to be holomorphic. So it's much richer than the topological definition we gave in general. Okay, so if you start from Riemann surface, the, the class of covering you can consider is very precise. Universal and with P, the projection, also holomorphic. Well, and well, X tilde is uniquely determined, well, this is obvious by the uniformization theorem up to by holomorphism, right? This is holomorphic universal covering of X. And now we have, now we can classify, right? So a Riemann surface is called elliptic or parabolic or hyperbolic. This is just the terminology, went in, this terminology went in use many many years ago. According to the fact that universal covering space is respectively the Riemann sphere, the complex plane, and the unit disk. So we are talking about elliptic Riemann surfaces, parabolic and hyperbolic, F respectively the universal covering space is Riemann sphere, 
plane and the disk. In fact, the three models represent three, three geometry models. And one is elliptic, the other is parabolic, and the third is hyperbolic. Good. Well, I just want to recall you that we are now uh, going to apply the notions of uh, automorphism of the covering in this setting, okay? So an automorphism is nothing but a transformation. Well, there is an extra, an extra dot here, I'm sorry. This transformation uh, which send fibers into fibers, right? In general. And as uh, I said last time, this is a group, right, with respect to composition, the automorphism of uh, the covering, that transformation from a group. And this group turns out to be, since the covering is a universal covering, turns out to be isomorphic to the first fundamental group of X, right? Remember that in general you have a, the quotient, if you have a regular, um, regular covering, you have the uh, out P over P star of blah, 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 but in this case, the P star of P1 of X tilde is trivial because P1 of X tilde is trivial. Um, and the group, well, this is another important property. X transitively on the so it acts on the fibers in general. So you know that one fiber is mapped into a suburban automorphism, right? Because P or of phi is P, right? This means exactly this. Phi can map point on a fiber into into the same fiber. But here I can say more. Uh, you take two pairs, two two sorry, two points. And the fiber for any pair y1, y2, and the fiber of x, then you can also find an automorphism of p such that y1 is mapping to y2 by phi on the same fiber, right? So it means that the action of out p on the fibers, on the fibers, is transitive, right? We already use introduced this terminology. Transitive means that two points can be mapped one into the other by the, by the group. Hmm? And finally, well, this is natural because you can take the orbit space as the quotient of x tilde over the action. So all the fiber is mapped into one point according to this uh, relation. And so x is bilomorphic to this. Okay? You can see this as a uh, quotient. Of course, I'm not going into the details of the proof because this is an overview of the subject. However, what I'm saying is that uh, you, can, you can read the proofs. So I think that you are smart enough, of course, and you have all the backgrounds to understand also the, the proof. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to enter the details of the proofs of this, this, this part, at least. Um, now, I can consider a subgroup of the group of automorphism. Like, remember, this was done already, right? And we, we say that gamma acts freely on X if no element of gamma, but the identity, of course, has a fixed point. That's why I stress several times about the description of fixed point set not only because I like it for my research, but because I think this is, well, a geometric property which is important also in dynamics, right? When you study orbits, uh, well, of course, the first points you want to study are the fixed points because in dynamics they represent some special points, right? Or periodic points, in some sense, okay? But this is just the definition about the group, of the subgroup. The action is said to be free or the group acts freely on a set if beside the identity no other no other element of the group or the subgroup has a fixed point. Of course the identity has all points fixed but this is kind of uh, unavoidable condition because you need to have the identity, right? 
So do we have examples of subgroups of the automorphous groups we study in the three models with that which act freely? Well, we do. If you remember, in the case of the plane automorphism, the plane is one of the models, right? In the plane models, we had, you know, linear transformation like A, Z plus B with A different from zero as possible transformation. The only automorphism of the plane are like this, with two parameters, A and B. And when we studied this, this uh, automorphism, I said, well, if A is equal to one and B different from zero, right, then necessarily the transformation Z is mapping to Z plus B as no fixed point. So translations are examples of a subgroup which acts freely on, on C. So this definition can be applied. Similarly, in the unit disk, we have, you remember, the possibility to have one fixed point inside or the both and one outside the disk or the two fixed points are on the band, distinct or coincident. Hmm? So for instance, if, if you restrict your attention to rotation around the origin, for instance, well, the origin is fixed for any of such uh, rotation. Hmm? So this subgroup represents a group who does not act freely on the unit disk. So this makes a difference so if you ask something. More. And this second definition is a bit more technical, but however, it is unavoidable. So uh, I have to introduce this way. So the action is proper discontinuous or gamma is properly discontinuous. The action is properly discontinuously. Uh, so the, the, sorry, the, the action is properly discontinuous like this here. At a point. If there exists a neighborhood of X such that, you see, the range gamma of U and U do not intersect, okay? For just a finite number of elements in the group gamma. This is a bit technical, but uh, this is what we need. Properly is continuous is that the number of elements in the group having this property is finite. I make a remark. I talk about a possible subgroup and the automorphic symbol C acting freely. Translations. And I also said something about the rotation in the unit disk. I couldn't say very much about free actions of subgroups in the case of automorphism of the Riemann sphere. Because if you remember, in that case, in that class of function, there are always at least one fixed point, right? Do you remember this? We show that if you start from a general linear fraction transformation and you impose a z plus b over c z plus t equal to z, you always find a solution in c hat. At least one. Which means that any automorphism has at least one fixed point. So none of them can act freely, except of course the identity, which is allowed to have infinitely many fixed points and represent a trivial subgroup. So in that sense, we can say, well, no trivial subgroup of no, no, sorry, no non-trivial subgroup of uh, um, well, what I did I write it this way? Well, I should have put here C hat, right? Can be fun. Okay. This proposition explains why we are assuming that the action of the automorphism of the Riemann surface is supposed to be properly discontinuous. Because then the subgroup or the group is discrete. It cannot be differently. Because assume that the group is not discrete, so it eventually has a limit point, right? 
right? And the limit point is an automorphism. I'm saying this because, well, you might say, well, we have seen that in case the function is just one to one, is injective. Not necessarily the limit function is injective. It can be constant. Remember this? This was an application of Hurwitz theorem, right? You start from a sequence of injective function, holomorphic injective functions, and the limit function might be also not injective. It might be constant. Remember, this was one of the problems also, and the proof of Riemann theorem, we had to restrict our our family. Yes, please. What is the discrete? Yeah, I don't know the definition. Discrete is means does not it doesn't contain uh, an accumulation point. It's not. It's, it doesn't. Well, it has to have. It can be considered continuous. Yes. They have, they say it is not continuous. Okay. Discrete in general means. Uh, no limit points, right? Well, well, let us go to this point. Assume that you have, you can find a sequence of automorphism in a subgroup acting properly discontinuously, okay, on X, and having a limit. I'm assume, I'm saying that the limit is still an automorphism. And this is because you can always take, you see, the inverse also of the fact, because we are dealing with automorphism, right? You start with a sequence gamma n, for instance. You can also consider gamma n minus 1, okay? So if gamma n tends to gamma and gamma n minus 1 tends to delta, I can show you that gamma and delta are one the inverse of the other, right? Because the limit is the identity of the composition of the two, right? This, this is a, a uniform limit, and this guarantees that the limit function turns out to be an automorphism. But if it had uh, this property, that starting from a sequence, you have a limit point. So if we're assuming that gamma is not discrete, then you can take gamma minus one, gamma n, as a new element in the group, and of course it is in the group, and this tends to be identity. Right? But then, as a seller, the identity makes this uh, action to be not properly discontinuous for infinitely many, right, uh, elements of the subgroup. I had that the intersection of U and gamma of U is different from, from the empty set. So this tells us something, so that we are, have to deal with if we are interested in something reasonable, we have to deal with discrete subgroups. And discrete means, well, in this sense, that there is no limit point. So if I want to consider, for instance, a subgroup of, uh, say, for instance, in, in the case of, of uh, translations in C, well, I cannot say, well, take B and and see uh, as you want, because I have to take a discrete subset. Okay, so I, I, at the end of the story, I will have a lattice instead of an open set of parameters to describe this, this set. This is the idea. And this is, in fact, the fundamental theorem which l put together all this information. You start from... Um, a Riemann surface, and you consider the automorphism uh, of the universal covering which exists, x till the p of x. While this automorphism group is properly discontinuous and acts freely on x tilde, you can prove it, okay? So if you start from a Riemann surface, cover it with a universal covering, uh, the automorphism, the deck transformations of the universal covering uh, is properly discontinuous and acts freely on X. And vice versa, if gamma is a properly discontinuous subgroup of the group, sorry, this G is not precise, of deck transformation acting freely on X, then you can always consider this 
uh, quotient play space and put on it a structure of Riemann surface in such a way that projection, which comes from this quotient, all right, is the canonical quotient map. And this function here is the universal holomorphic covering of this Riemann surface. So, in some sense, you can describe all possible Riemann surfaces as soon as you know the uniformization theorem and the fact that you can describe them in terms of quotient of x tilde, this plane and Riemann sphere, by the action of a subgroup of out p, of, so the automorphism of, uh, of respectively Riemann sphere, uh, plane and disk, unit disk, acting properties continuous uh, um, and freely on x tilde. So, two Riemann surfaces are biomorphic if they have the same universal covering and if the fundamental groups which are related to the subgroups, right, of our P are conjugated in the group of deck transformation. So, this is quite easy to, to see, putting together the, the previous results. But this is a proposition that has to be put. So, this is what I wanted to show you. We have some classification. So, there is only one elliptic Riemann surface up to biomorphism, the Riemann sphere. Why? Well, you start from a Riemann surface and you say, okay, we have three classes, can be covered by C, disk, and Riemann sphere. Let us start from the Riemann sphere, right? What are the possible choices of a subgroup acting freely and properties continuous? There is only the trivial subgroup. As I said, all the other groups do not act freely. So, only the Riemann sphere can be considered as a quotient of itself, right? So, for the others, what can we see? Well, the properly discontinuous subgroup of out C, remember the out C, uh, uh, the automorphism are of this, uh, uh, of, of, of the plane, are described in this way. The general automorphism Z map is mapping to AZ plus B, right? We want to have an action which is free. A has to be equal to 1. So we have the freedom of choosing just B. But B cannot be chosen randomly. <laughs> it has to be chosen in such a way that the action is properly discontinuous. It is to say it has to be discrete as a subgroup. So either we have a translation along the reals or along the reals and along the, um, along the, so along the, we have a lattice here uh, in the plane. And tau is what is called the module of the of this lattice, and is an element in the upper half plane. So it has an imaginary part positive. So we have a translation along the reals and a translation with a component along the vertical line. Oh, not the vertical line, definitely. Hmm? These are the only possibilities up to conjugation. Consequently. These are the Riemann, parabolic Riemann surfaces, so covered by C. Either C, C itself, obvious, or C minus one point, the puncture plane, which comes from here. Imagine that you are wrapping, right, everything. And the final and interesting case is this one, right? So you have a lattice of points. And imagine to have this as a fundamental set. And all, everything is identified. So the sides of this rectangle, not necessarily a rectangle, but rhomboid, whatever, are identified. So typically, these two sides are identified side by side. Opposite side are identified. And this gives you the structure of a torus. That's why they are called complex tori. But beside names and beyond names, these are the only possibilities in terms of discrete subgroups of out C available, acting freely. So I want to repeat this. 
A is equal to 1 because we want the action to be free. So no fixed point beside the identity. And then here, we cannot put a continuous set of parameters B because otherwise the, 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 group, the subgroup described is not discrete. It would be, have a, 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 fix, uh, sorry, a limit point. And these are the only possibility. Either, well, in this case, T, this tau is 0, so translations along the reals, or translations along the reals, and independently also along the vertical axis. OK, let us, let us make some, some observation about the, well, the Riemann sphere is connected, but also it's like S2, right? It is simply connected, right? It is simply connected. So the, the fundamental group can be easily found to be. The fundamental group is, you remember, the class of, of loops uh, um, and, well, you will calculate it. OK, in any case, it is simply connected. So the, the, each loop can be contracted to one point, right? However, this also turns out to be true for C, but not for C minus one point, because zero is one of the point, right? It's a puncture plane, because if you take a loop going around the, the, the origin, you cannot deform it to a point, right? It is an obstruction, right? And well, this is not simply connected. This is not simply connected either. But you can calculate and show that, well, there is just one generator. If you remember, like in an analysis, right? You start from one important loop going around the point, And all other loops like this are, are combination of this generator. The other loops which do not go around this this point, this uh, origin, this case, can be contracted to, an, to, to a point easily. But all the others can be deformed to the chosen one. So there is one generator, and that, that is enough to say uh, that the fundamental group of the puncture plane is Z, is isomorphic to Z. Whereas for the torus, the torus can be seen as, well, this is complex torus, but the torus as S1 times S1 uh, as generated by one generator here and one generator here, right? We have the structures, the donut, right? One generator is here, which tells you the number of times you are moving this way, and the number of times you move this way. So you have two generators, and with some You can imagine, at least, that the fundamental group is Z, direct sum Z, all right? In all these cases, what we have is the following. Either it is simply connected, or the fundamental group is Z, or Z, direct sum Z. In all these cases, these uh, fundamental groups turn out to be a billion. They are a billion. But as I said last time, in general, the fundamental group is not necessarily a billion. Sure. Yes, but tau is fixed. No, no, tau is fixed. This varies, and tau is fixed. Exactly. Exactly. So in fact, this is gamma tau. Tau, is, yeah, no. Tau is not, is not changed. Well, I probably have to, yeah, you're right. So mn varies, and tau is fixed. All right, yes. Notation is probably misleading. You are correct. Tau is given, right? What I, I could use, uh, it is correct. What I wanted to say, though, there is a real part which varies on the discrete set like Z, and here I have a part which is real and imaginary, right? So in, in this part, the imaginary part, in this, sorry, in this set, the imaginary part is 
zero. Right? So the, what you change here is just the real part. Here you change real and imaginary part, but correct. Tau is fixed, is given. Right. Okay. I, 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 will, I will adjust to the... Thank you. However, also from here you can have an idea that while you have, you see N here, tells you that every time you identify everything as a cylinder. It is like S1 times an infinite line. So you have just one generator and the infinite line can be squeezed to a disk and then you consider just the contour. One generator. Here you have two generators, M and N, which tells you that you have in fact one S1 and one S1 working independently as generators of all possible loops and the towers. What I, well, this is probably something beyond your knowledge in algebraic topology, but what I want to stress is here, is, uh, at, this, at this stage, is that, however, what you can imagine is that these fundamental groups are all billion. Therefore, whenever you have something, a Riemann, a, a, Riemann, a Riemann surface, which is uh, whose, whose fundamental um, group is not a billion, you can say, well, it is not elliptic, neither parabolic, it has to be hyperbolic. All right? So that's first point. And so every domain in the Riemann sphere whose complement contains at least three points must be a hyperbolic, hyperbolic Riemann surface. Because if it has more than two points, right, at least three points, then the, 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 the fundamental group turns out to be generated by two generators, but the fundamental group is the free group Z, Z which is not abelian, at least. So if you take two points out from the plane, which is the minimal request. Okay, by, if you remove one point, the complement is infinite and one point, right? And we have Z as generated. But if you take two points, well, it is like an eight figure in the plane, right? In the eight figures, it's not like S1 times S1, not at all. We have one generator and another generator, and you have a combination of these two independently. So it's not and a billion group. So this is interesting because it, has, it leads to many consequences. So every bounded domain in the plane must be hyperbolic Riemann surface. And this is what? Another important fact. Remember that we have the definition of holomorphic function between Riemann surfaces. And remember the last time we were talking about coverings, I was also saying that it is in general possible to consider the cover transformation as in general, cover transformation is the function which plays the role of commuting the diagram at the level of universal covering. And this is always possible to be found, right? So I assume that F is holomorphic and X is non-hyperbolic, whereas Y is hyperbolic. Okay, go to the level of covering. You have something which is either the plane or the Riemann sphere. On the other hand, you have that Y is covered by the unit disk. So you would have a diagram closed by a function between the plane or the Riemann sphere into the unit disk. So it would be a holomorphic function, entire, and bounded, so it would be constant. So necessarily F is constant. And putting together all this stuff, since uh, we can say that every domain in the Riemann sphere whose complement contains at least three points is a Riemann surface, which turns out to be hyperbolic, then we have a little Picard theorem now proved. Every entire function missing two values is constant. Of course, the plane is covered by the plane. The, cover, the plane minus two points, and uh, as in the complement of the Riemann sphere has three points, and discovered by the disk. And this shows you the 
how elegant now the, the, the little Picard theorem becomes. It's a consequence of all this machinery. So let me quickly go to this. So here is the description of all Riemann surfaces up to biomorphism with a billion group, fundamental group. So it is trivial. If it is trivial, so it is, well, necessarily mean, it means that X is simply connected, so it is by uniformization of theorem either the unit disk or the complex plane or the Riemann sphere. And if it is Z, it can be either the puncture plane or the disk minus one point or the annulus, right, up to biolomorphism. And we know that they, they, can, they can be deforming, uh, so there is a, a, a line of possible choices of, uh, you remember, we, we have shown that two, two, annulus, two annuli are biolomorphic if and only if the ratios of the radii are the same, right? And finally, well, uh, the direct sum of z, so z, direct sum z is the last possibility, and then necessarily x is a complex torus. This gives you the complete descriptions of all of it. And two complex tori are, well, complex tori are very much studied, and I'll explain you in the, the last 15 minutes why, are biolomorphic. If and only, so two complex tori are identified using this tau, okay? So gamma tau, and tau is fixed, take tau and another tau, tau, tau one and tau two, and this gives you two lattices, two groups, discrete subgroups, and then two tori in the quotient. And these are biolomorphic if and only if there exists a two by two invertible matrix with A, B, oh sorry, this is A here, yeah, right? No, it's two, right? Of course, sorry for this. Such that one, tau 1 is mapping to the other using this very simple, this is a linear fractional transformation, you see? So one torus is mapping to the other. And this guarantees that two tori are biolomorphic. So the class of non-biolomorphic tori have been heavily studied. Because it is easy to say, well, I can pass from one to the other with this very simple condition. And this is the difficult part. So, given a complex torus, you can choose the tau one, tau 1, so the module, to be with, of course, positive imaginary part and the real part in between minus 1 half and 1 half. And, and the tau itself is mo in modules greater than 1, all right? Uh, in case it is 1, then necessarily R21 is greater or equal to 0. And you can obtain just one of this moduli and, and this, in this strip. It is an infinite strip, as I show you in the next picture. In fact, it is this strip here. The condition tells you the following. So, you take any torus in the plane, sorry, any torus, sorry, any torus, any complex torus, so any parabolic Riemann surface. Then, up to biolomorphisms, it is just represented as, sorry, as the quotient C over gamma tau, and tau is taken in this infinite strip here. So the real part is in between minus one half and one half. Modulus of tau is greater than one, and so this means that we have the complete description. This, this set here, this uh, gray set, subset of the plane describes you, in each point you have a different complex torus, not biolomorphic to the others. So there are very many not biolomorphic, right? This is called the fundamental domain, or the fundamental region for the tori. And assume that you move, like I move, I'm moving the mouse here, okay? And you imagine to have a complex torus associated to each point, okay, in the center of the cross of the torus, right? You have different tori each time I move, and two of them are never biolomorphic to one another. Just this precise description. Whereas if I go here and here, of course, I obtain tori which are 
which can be bilamorphic, right? Now, just in the few slides, just a few slides to tell you the important relation with projective algebraic, uh, projective, uh, projective plane curves. So a plane curve is given by as a, a zero set of a polynomial of degree d, and then we obtain in CP2, for instance, okay? It's a plane curve, so we are, t we are dealing with something which is in the plane, so it's CP2, right? So x0, x1, x2 are defined up to a constant, not necessarily, not necessarily, necessarily not equal to zero. And, and this polynomial has to be homogeneous, of course, to define something reasonable in this setting, right? Are you familiar with this notation? This means that x0, x1, x2 are defined up to a constant different from zero, okay? So these are homogeneous coordinates of point in CP2, and p of x0, x1, x2 is equal to zero, has a meaning because p is homogeneous, okay? So this is the definition of plane curve. And this is of degree d because the polynomial which defines it is of degree d. Well, CP is a closed set, the zero level set of a polynomial. So it's an inverse image of the zero, right? Of a continuous function in CP2, which is compact. So CP, is, so the curve is compact. And the projective plane curve is, yes. Yes, that's natural to consider. But it's, well, CP2 is, is definitely compact in any case because it is, it is a ball, right? Right? So you can, you can define the risky topology, say, if you want. Uh, so you, you define the topology using the, 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 the zero set of polynomials. But in this case, it is obvious. They are considering a continuous function. You imagine to, to define a topology which makes polynomial continuous. That, that's the minimal request. Otherwise, you are working in a strange world, right? Furthermore, if you take the derivative with respect to xj of any homogeneous polynomial, you obtain a homogeneous polynomial of degree one minus, one less than the degree of p, right? So the set S of p where all the derivatives of p vanish is well defined in this setting, and this is called the singular point set of the plane curve C. So typically, this is the case when there is a self-intersection or there is a cusp or something like this, right? Go. So this is the important theorem. Any non-singular projective plane curve, so I repeat, any projective plane curve whose singular point set is empty, so non-singular means it has no self-intersection or same, huh? is a complex Riemann surface. Can be regarded as a complex Riemann surface. Why? Well, since uh, you apply Dini's uh, theorem or implicit, uh, implicit uh, uh, function theorem in order to define local coordinates. And you show that since the derivative are not all zero at any point, you can define global, sorry, you can define on the entire set the local coordinates and the function turns out to be one complex and dimensional. And well, if the function has some bad points or some, some sync, oops, sorry. This is some mistake here. Well, what I wanted to, s to write here is, of course, less CP without the singular points. Sorry for this. Okay. If uh, X is a compact Riemann surface, then you can always find an irreducible projective plane curve CP, the allomorphic function phi, from x into cp, such that after removing some points from x and the singular points, I'm sorry for the singular points of the curve, you obtain a bilomorphic. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Riemann, compact Riemann surfaces, and plane projective curves, okay? Up to the, the, the removing the, the, after removing the, the singularity. Well, there is also uh, one uh, explicit, and when I say explicit, I mean that um, 
in principle, it is a way to find the correspondence for tori, for complex tori. And uh, for complex tori, the, the, um, the tool used is the Weierstrass elliptic function, which is associated to a discrete module in C. Remember that the tori were obtained as a quotient of a plane under the action of the discrete subset gamma, gamma tau, right? The reasonable tori, not the, the puncture plane, because it's not too interesting, right? And this is, in fact, a lattice or a discrete zeta models in, in C. And Weierstrass introduced a function which is like this. And gamma of tau represents the lattice, okay? So you define this function like this. And this is called Weierstrass elliptic function. It turns out to be periodic. Then if the complex torus is C over gamma tau, and this is the gamma, uh, the, the Weierstrass elliptic function, then you can show that P defines the projective plane curve CP as a zero set of this polynomial here. Where these coefficients are known, one, four, and these two, G2 and G3, are unknown, but can be calculated using this formula here. Pardon me? I'm sorry. I'll show you again. So CP is, CP2 has coordinate X0, X1, X2. Yes, of course, I do have homogeneous. I do have homogeneous. I said from the very beginning, these are homogeneous coordinates. And in fact, this is a homogeneous, sorry, this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree 3, right? In X0, X1, X2. Otherwise, it has no meaning. I'm working in the projective complex plane, right? So X0, X1, X2 are, yes, um, uh, homogeneous coordinates in CP2. And what is interesting is that, well, it, it seems to be reasonable, well, G2 and G3 can be found. Well, G2 is, in fact, 60 times S4 gamma tau, and G3 is 140 S6 gamma tau. Well, SK gamma tau is this. So it depends on your ability in calculating this, this uh, the convergence of this uh, series, okay? As W varies in and the subgroup gamma in the in the subgroup gamma tau, but not but is not zero, and this was done by hand, uh, bare hands uh, by Weierstrass. And this is surprising that he showed in some cases G two and G three can be explicitly calculated. So in any, so in principle, but now we can use also the uh, uh, numerical analysis and the, the, the power of. Uh, of uh, computer science to calculate, or at least to approximate numerically G2 and G3 in general. And so in principle, you start from a uh, complex torus. You can see it as a point in the infinite strip I showed you in the half plane. Or you can see it as the zero set of a polynomial of degree 3, whose coefficients are somehow explicitly found. So this gives you different ways to see the same object. Well, this class of uh, Riemann surfaces or projective plane curves, now we, are, we can talk up, we can use them as synonym, are in fact examples of elliptic curves. And elliptic curves are, in fact, algebraic curves of genus 1, whatever it means to you, all right, uh, are very important and very much. Um, very, have had many applications in uh, algebraic geometry. They are abelian varieties. You can so define um, uh, an, an, inner fun an inner operation multiplication, say, with, with respect to which uh, the, the elliptic curves are form a group, a commutative group. Uh, elliptic curves are important in number theory for several reasons and have been applied in the proof of uh, the 
famous proof of Fermat's last theorem by Andrew Wiles and uh, well, you know that the story of this, uh, this proof has been, well, Fermat conjectured that uh, you cannot find a, do you know the story? Yes. Yeah, of course, you, you, some of you know the story. When I was your age, uh, uh, of course it was a conjecture because I'm quite old now. No. And uh, <laughs> it was one of the problems, you know. And I was in a, in a summer school with other colleagues. And one, uh, at that time, we didn't have any internet access, okay? Internet was not known. I'm sorry to say this because it means that I'm very old, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in this summer school, just the news of a possible solution of uh, this uh, Fermat's last year. Well, of course, there, were, there have been many attempts during the, the centuries when Fermat, you know this, the, the story of the problem. Okay. It's a generalization of, uh, the problem is a generalization uh, of a solution in the integers of uh, the Pythagoras theorem, right? Some sense, okay? Instead of putting two as, as exponent, you put something greater than two. So you say x, uh, x to the power n plus y to the power n is z to the power n. Does it have a solution uh, in the not trivial solution in the integer? So for, for n equal to two, it is known that this is possible. Because all, all the, the triples, which are called Pythagoras triple, right? So for instance, three, four, and five is okay. So nine plus 16 is 25, right? So is there anything, is there any, uh, any analog of this in case n is greater than two? And it was conjectured that this is not true because Fermat, who was not a mathematician, was a, an expert. Sure. Pardon me? He was a lawyer, right? So he was kind of a lawyer. That time. He, was, he, he, he lived in the 16th century. But he was, uh, uh, I don't know, he was, uh, he was fond of mathematics. And he, he, he went to libraries and took the old Greek books, Diophantine equations, and so on, and solved all the left exercises. In some sense, there are, there are some exercises, exercises. In these old books, there are something which is not proved. And he, he proved everything. But only one proof was missing, and this was the proof was, it was missing. So the, this, the statement is like, but he left a comment on the right hand side. I have, a, in Latin, I have a wonderful proof of this, but I have not enough space on this book to write it down. So people say, okay, it has to be affordable, because all the other proofs are correct. But Gauss said, well, Gauss himself said, well, I'm sure he didn't have such a very short proof, <laughs> because it's not short. He, Euler worked a lot on this, and none of them could find a solution. So eventually, there, well, you know, of course, in the, in the history of mathematics, there, were, there have been many attempts. The, the, all of them failed to be considered a proof, right? Then, the, uh, with the, the implementation of uh, computer numerical um, simulation, it was obvious that and reasonable that something true is in the conjecture, because they proved it for millions and millions of numbers, and it was clearly true. But, uh, however, the proof is, well, the modern proof was given, well, that was announced in 1990. Seven. No, 19, sorry, 19, sorry, I'm sorry. It was announced in, in, say, in summer 1993, 94. Okay, he announced. Yeah. But, yes, exactly. Taylor, 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 Taylor right. Because Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Wiles uh, is an English mathematician. And there was also this uh, fact that an English mathematician could prove a theorem which was French. So there was uh, another struggling uh, <laughs> between. <laughs> so for instance, Le Monde announced, of course, that the first proof given by, Le by Andrew Wise was not correct very happily, OK? This uh, Brit <laughs> British uh, mathematician is not able to prove it. 
Uh, however, on the other side, on the time, on the, the time, you could see well, a great ma result by a, an English mathematician. The, 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 the last uh, Fermat theorem is proved. It, what happened is that Andrew Wiles announced the, the, the result using this uh, elliptic curves techniques and many others because uh, uh, he proved, well, he, he was obsessed by this, by this problem. When he was very young, he knew of the problem and uh, something completely un unusual for the time, for, for, for the time we were living, he decided to work on this, on this problem by himself, alone, without the help of anybody and without communicating to anybody his partial results. And he has worked for seven years. And, well, there is a ni very nice uh, book about the, the, the story of this uh, proof. In fact, when he announced everything in summer, it could be in a seminar, during, the semin during a, a, a series of seminars he gave in summer 1993. In fact, he didn't write everything. That he gave it in to, 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 a, a, to a staff of, uh, of referees after some months, probably, right? So it was 1994 when the referees start checking everything. It is, well, nowadays, it's around 100 of pages, right, the proof, something like this. It's not very short. Okay? So we had the feeling that it was all right. And also the referees at the beginning said, well, this is a good idea. It's a great idea because the techniques are very elegant, very, but at a certain point, you know, they discovered that with some assumption, one part is true, but cannot be applied for the others, or, you know, like in a game. So he disappeared from the world because he received some mails saying, can you please explain how you can apply this lemma in this context? Because the assumption seems to be a bit different. And then he admitted that, well, of course, he realized that the proof was not correct. So he spent six months to try to, to cover the gap which uh, is very difficult, in fact, after seven years, right? And uh, with, the, with the help of Richard Taylor, and uh, well, it is very touching uh, in, 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 the, in, in a direct interview, it is, it is very touching to see him that he describes the precise moment where he realized that I can do, I can do it. Just in one morning, uh, say, I'm, I was in my office because he put himself a deadline after, say, one year, I have to to uh, announce that I couldn't. I failed, essentially. But in one, in uh, in few hours, he, he covered the gap and said, "Okay." I went out from my room, my office. I closed the door just to be sure that nobody enters. Then I went around. They came back, checked everything. It's fine. And I said, "It's the most exciting t uh, moment in my scientific life," and so on and so forth. But in the meanwhile, he became more than 40, and so it couldn't be awarded by the Fields, Fields Medal, yes, that's true. However, this is just a story. Let me tell you just to, to complete the stuff. If you start from a polynomial of degree 3, right, and you consider this new polynomial, right, this is a polynomial equation, y squared is equal to px. P is a polynomial of degree 3. And, well, the degree 3 means that the, the, it can be split into three linear factors with different roots, okay? So you have on the right-hand side three roots. Um, then you obtain a non-singular plane curve, uh, and uh, its genus, genus is 1. Whatever genus means here, well, we know genus 1 is a description for, is a, another way to say elliptic curves. And so it can be written in general like x minus alpha, x minus beta, x minus gamma, but you can actually say that after rearranging, alpha can be zero, beta can be, can be one, and the only parameter left is the last one. So with this, sim with this simple tool, you obtain any complex torus if you want. As it is described by this, the, the zero set of this polynomial equation or 
it is uh, an elliptic curve of genus 1 or it is um, one dimensional complex uh, um, parabolic parabolic Riemann surface. That's it. Thank you for your attention.